I remember the ribbons tied around the trees and posts in the Leesburg, Virginia apartment complex where I lived with my mother and younger sister in 1994. They were hung for a boy, the son of the apartment complex's maintenance man. Victor Shoemaker was a tall, quiet man who seemed to be as much a part of the place as the playground, the pool, or the brick facade of the buildings. On a weekend off, Victor had taken his family, his wife Nettie, and their five-year-old son Victor Jr., who they called JR, to visit family in the mountains of nearby West Virginia. Victor and Nettie returned, but JR would never see his home again. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Victor Dwight J.R. Shoemaker. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. J.R. Shoemaker had just turned five on March 30th, 1994. An only child, he loved hanging out with his older cousins, eight-year-old Lloyd Wolford and nine-year-old Tommy Martin, and running around the woods on Short Mar Mountain, where his step-grandfather, Oscar Wolford, lived. Now, you know, we have a, a young one, we have a three-year-old and two older boys, and you can imagine. I mean, so, so J.R. was five, his cousins were eight and nine. I mean, he must have been in absolute heaven, just yeah. running around with them. <laughs> Now, where did you say that they lived? So, um, they lived in Leesburg, okay. Virginia, and they were in uh, on Short Mountain in, in West Virginia, visiting, uh, it was J.R.'s step-grandfather. Okay. So, the boys adored the woods, and when they were together, they would go out and go a-hunting. <laughs> well, often, they would return with tales of big bucks they had killed. One time, J.R.'s cousin Tommy actually killed a rabbit. And JR was so excited that he took off and ran on his own back to the, his step grandfather's trailer to tell his mother all about it. So JR may have been young, but trying to keep up with the older boys had made him scrappy and he knew his way around those woods. Nettie had struggled for years to conceive and rarely let JR out of her sight. But she felt safe on the mountain. They were surrounded by family and the setting was familiar. Their apartment in Leesburg certainly wasn't in a dangerous area or anything like that, mm -hmm. but it also wasn't in the best part of town. On top of the mountains, surrounded by nature and family, Nettie felt at ease. So that's why on the morning of May 1st, 1994, she dressed JR in a red Bugs Bunny t-shirt, red shorts, and white X-Men sneakers and sent him out to traverse the woods with his older cousins as she had done countless times before. But... When Lloyd and Tommy returned to the trailer at 8.30 a.m., they didn't come with tales of wild animals and forest adventures. They came with downcast eyes, and more importantly, they came without JR. Now, according to the two boys, they were out in the woods when JR said he was hungry. Now, the older boys wanted to stay out and play, so JR headed back to the trailer alone, but JR never made it back. And I mean, you can see that, right? Like, you can see that, you know, the boys, because they had just left at like eight. So they had just gotten out there, basically. And of course, the young one yeah. is immediately like, oh, I'm hungry. Typical. I'm hungry or I have to go to the bathroom. Exactly, yeah. right? Luckily, they're in the woods and they were boys, so I'm sure if they, if it had been the bathroom, they would have taken care right. of that. But right. yeah, so they just, you know, they didn't want to stop playing. They didn't want to go back home. And so they sent him back alone. And I think that's really where, I mean, a, a lot of this gets sticky for people. Right. So... In an interview that Nettie gave to the Virginia pilot in December of 1994, she said that she asked the boys three times, where's JR? He's up in the woods, was the reply. They never looked at me, nothing, Nettie said. Nettie immediately sprang into action, and she and Victor started frantically combing the woods for their son. The problem is, for an hour, they were looking in the wrong place. You see, Lloyd and Tommy knew they were in trouble, and they were only eight and nine years old, respectively, but they were in charge of looking after their younger cousin. On top of that, they knew they weren't supposed to play around the abandoned trailers that dotted the hillside. So they didn't immediately tell the adults that those abandoned trailers are where they last saw their little cousin. Mm. Yeah. So how, how abandoned 
quote unquote, are these abandoned trailers? Well, or, exactly, right? Or is it, are we getting to that? Well, no, I mean, that that's the thing. Like, these abandoned trailers, apparently, and you know, they are pretty common in mm-hmm. that area. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how abandoned they were. So... Eventually, everything kind of got figured out, and the older boys led the adults to the spot in the woods where they actually last saw Jr. Mm-hmm. about a half mile from Oscar Wolford's trailer. But Nettie and Vict- Victor were already panicking, of course, because Jr. knew the woods, and so if it was just a matter of him getting turned around on his way back, like they would have heard it or seen something by then. Mm-hmm. The shoemakers knew that something horrible had happened. So the family called authorities, and before noon, the woods were teeming with police, firefighters, neighbors, and volunteers all searching for the lost little boy. So again, I mean, this isn't one of those situations where, you know, people wait or authorities right. are we're, we're, we're talking about a matter of less than, what, four hours? Yeah. So, I mean, so the boys left at around 8. Mm-hmm. The older boys came home at 8.30. Okay. And so, again, not too long. And, uh, uh, you know, they started looking for JR immediately in the wrong place sure. for about an hour. Okay. But then, you know, they were still looking around the woods. And, and again, yeah, so less than four hours later, before noon, everybody was out. So full court press. Um, the search lasted throughout the day and into the night. Spirits started to flag as the sun went down and the night turned cold, with temperatures hovering right above freezing and a light rain falling. Searchers began to worry that J.R., who is only 40 pounds and dressed in shorts and a t-shirt, may not fare well in those conditions. Mm. But hope wasn't lost because Robert J. Walker, who was the chief of the local volunteer company number three, was one of the first to arrive on the scene. A few years previously, he had been involved in a similar search. Two young boys had gone missing nearby when they were visiting their grandparents. Rescuers searched throughout the night and found the boys the next morning, alive, huddled up next to a log. So he hoped that this story would have a similar swift and happy resolution. Mm -hmm. But night fell, the sun rose, and still there was no trace of J.R. The next day, Monday, May 2nd, the Assembly of God Church in Kirby, which is, you know, the nearby town, became a 24-hour command post for the search. The entire county seemingly came out to look for the lost little boy in the woods. The local McDonald's donated food and drinks to the search parties. And by that Thursday, when JR still had not been found, over 400 volunteers came out from Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and even North Carolina to help wow. find JR. Yeah. That's a, that's a pretty dramatic response. Yeah, exactly. And it was all volunteers because, again, this kid's five, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's no sign of him. Hmm. So by, by this point, it's Thursday. He goes missing on Sunday. They have found nothing. They haven't found, you know, any, any indication that anything bad happened, you know, but they haven't found any, anything at all, anything, no clothes, no blood. I mean, nothing. Authorities used helicopters with heat seeking sensors during the search. Wow. Yeah. Divers searched bodies of water, even local school children were allowed to miss class to help with the effort. Hmm. But despite all that, again, not a single clue was found. I'm assuming that during this search, they had gone into these abandoned trailers? Yeah, they don't mention it specifically in anything that I read, but I mean... I can't imagine that they would miss that. When you have hundreds of people searching on this mountain, I don't think anybody... I mean, they do talk about some of the houses um, on the mountain, but they don't talk specifically about going in them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, they, they are looking at everything, you know? Now, what's the, what's the terrain like? I know that you, you just said that they used divers for bodies of water. Is there, is there any type of, and maybe you don't know this, I don't, I don't know the area. Um, is there like a quarry, some, some place that's where the water would be insanely deep? deep? There really wasn't a lot said about water, you know, mm-hmm. so, so I get the impression that, if there were quarries or something nearby, it's not something that would have been easily accessible. Like, it doesn't sound like a lot of people thought that he accidentally drowned, right. you know. Well, if, if he was taken, that's a different story, sure. of course. Yeah. Um, but 
But yeah, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of opportunities other than creeks and kind of shallow bodies of water for an, a water accident to happen. By this time, people were, of course, coming up with theories about what could have possibly happened to JR. Now, one of the initial suspicions is that JR fell victim to a careless hunter. Mm-hmm. Hunters were common on Short Mountain, and, you know, accidents happen. But if Jara had been inadvertently shot by a hunter, surely someone would have heard something or seen some trace of the boy. But again, there was nothing. On top of that, J.R. went missing on a Sunday, and hunting on Sundays was illegal in West Virginia. So, you know, if they had heard hunters, like, it really would have stuck out in people's minds. Right, and plus you said that he was wearing a red shirt, correct? Exactly, red shirt, red shorts. It's not as though he's wearing, like, a camo outfit where he'd be easily, easily... um, mistaken, mis- mistaken for, yeah. for, for an animal or no, something. No, not yeah. at all. Right. So another theory was that JR simply got lost in the woods. <clears throat> Perhaps he fell and injured himself. Maybe an animal got him. But again, people were looking for him so quickly after he disappeared. The three boys left at 8 and Lloyd and Tommy were back by 8.30. Mm-hmm. It seems somewhat unbelievable that no one would find a single trace of him. No blood, no pieces of clothing, nothing. Then there are, of course, the more sinister theories that J.R. ran into someone in the woods who meant to do him harm. His mother, Nettie, told the Virginian pilot that J.R. was a friendly boy who she could see being easily enticed by a stranger. Mm. Plus, the boys are playing around those abandoned trailers, and like you mentioned, who knows if they were really abandoned. For their part, the shoemakers believe they weren't given the whole story. Nettie Shoemaker told the Virginia pilot that she believes Lloyd and Tommy, who were kids afraid of being in trouble, didn't tell them everything that happened, saying, quote, I still say the two boys know something. I'm not saying they're guilty of anything. I'm saying they have to know something. Somebody had to have taken him off of the hill, end quote. So police, of course, tried to determine if the cousins did, in fact, know more about what happened to Jr. than they initially told the adu- adults. They administered lie detector tests and even had them go through a play therapy exam. So I was surprised that they gave polygraphs to eight and nine year olds. I didn't know that that was a thing. Well, it's yeah. I mean, it doesn't. What, we all know polygraphs are inconclusive too. So what 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 is that gives you some sort of baseline, I suppose, if you're interrogating. But I've I've never, I've never heard of of children. Being given a polygraph, being given right? A polygraph. Yeah, and especially so, especially if they're not suspects. In, right. I mean, well, I mean, again, kind of, but yeah, not really. I, I don't think suspects in the fact that you know they thought that they did anything. But I'm, you know, Nettie does bring up a good point, which is again, they were scared kids. Right. They weren't. They they didn't initially tell the truth because they didn't say where they had last seen Jr. Because they didn't want to get in even worse trouble than they were already in. Right. And, you know, so I think it's natural to think that they know more. I just don't know how effective a polygraph would be. Um, it probably wouldn't be, especially kids that age would be nervous about right. anything like that. So the readings would be all over the place. Yeah. And, um, and but, you know, the play therapy. That's interesting. That, you know, that's interesting. So yeah. that seems like it, it might have elicited more, you know, more. Uh, more of a genuine response. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Something a little bit more reliable. The results of both the polygraph and the play therapy exam indicated that the boys were being truthful. Mm. So, and the cousins also aren't the only ones who took polygraphs in connection with JR's disappearance. His father, Victor Sr., and Tommy's mother, Sherry Lynn Musselman, both passed polygraph exams as well. With no further answers coming from the family and absolutely no clues being recovered from the woods where JR went missing, investigators were at a loss. Days turned into weeks, which stretched into months, and still, they were no closer to finding J.R. than they had been when Nettie first tore into the woods, calling his name within minutes of his disappearance. Many people thought that the most likely explanation was that J.R. succumbed to the elements and that he would eventually be found somewhere on the mountain. However, there were some who believed that J.R. fell victim to foul play, and this belief would soon take the investigation into an entirely new direction. Hey guys, have you heard about Anchor Podcasts? It is the easiest way to start your own podcast. In fact, it is how I created this one. So let me tell you about it. Number one, most important, it is 
free. Um, you can also use creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. They'll even distribute your podcast for you. So they'll make sure that you get onto Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and all these other amazing podcast platforms so that you can find listeners. You can also make money from your podcast. They have built-in monetization tools and there's no minimum listenership required. It is everything you need to make a podcast all in one place and I can't recommend it highly enough. If you want to get started, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm today. In November of 1994, six months after JR was last seen, the FBI got involved under the jurisdiction of the federal kidnapping law. This means that the agency, who had been monitoring the situation since the beginning, thought that there was a chance that someone had taken the five-year-old across state lines. In the same Virginian pilot article, Wells L. Morrison, the special agent supervising the case, wouldn't give much insight into the reasons the FBI got involved, saying only, quote, the FBI considers this matter to be a high-priority investigation, end quote. But despite the FBI's involvement, the case grew colder and colder. As 1994 drew to a close, authorities had seemingly exhausted every possible avenue. Weeks after his disappearance, JR's case was featured on America's Most Wanted. Shortly after, the National Guard was called in. They were followed by an Army Reserve Special Forces Unit and 14 cadaver dogs. These new searches did uncover potential clues. One of the bloodhounds appeared to catch JR's scent near a paved subdivision, the only way out of the woods by car. However, this was dismissed as a red herring by state trooper C.J. Ellison, who had been on the case since the beginning. He claimed that too many people had trampled over that area for the scent to be reliable. Searchers also found footprints outside of a nearby home, leading some to believe that JR had sought shelter there but the footprints were later determined to be too large. Other searches revealed three rocks arranged in a triangle with a stick in the middle and three logs on the sides, leading some to speculate that JR had tried to set up camp. But there was no physical evidence that the five-year-old had ever actually been there. So again, clothes, blood, hair. Nothing. Nothing. Hmm. This state trooper that dismisses the the dog finding it. He's the lead investigator. Oh, is he? Yeah, so he has been on since the very beginning. Police were so desperate for clues that they weren't discounting anything, even psychic visions. Shortly after JR's disappearance, Trooper Ellison received a phone call from 41-year-old Louis G. Gano, a self-proclaimed psychic from Bridgeport, Ohio. According to the Virginia pilot, Gano told Ellison, quote, I seem to be the little boy. I'm on this hillside. The sun would move from my right to my left. There's a crevice to this hillside. I'm looking into a valley, not a deep valley, and straight ahead of me there's this house, a shack, something of that nature, and there seems to be a hill behind it. Looking to the right of the shack behind it, there are trees. To the left of the shack, the trees seem to diminish. As the hill drops straight down, there is a road there. Sitting there, looking down at the shack, the boy I feel ends up at the shack. End quote. While the description of trees, a hillside, and a shack may seem generic, the man's vision gave Trooper Ellison chills. The location Gano was describing existed, and Ellison knew exactly where it was. Not only that, but Gano had a track record of actually providing good information in cases like this. In late 1991, a West Virginia coal miner was swept away in a flood. Gano told authorities that he had a vision that the miner's body would be found in a creek under a bright yellow marking. And sure enough, in January of 1992, two beaver trappers found the miner in a creek under a tree stabbed with a bright yellow feather-tipped arrow. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Trooper Ellison, Exhausting all options. You got to exhaust, yep. and especially when you know he's like, "Oh, I know where that is." Like, yeah, that's that's got to that's got to be creepy from yeah, you know, a, a law enforcement perspective to to hear something like that from a you know quote unquote psychic. Yeah, and then to know exactly what he's talking about—that's got to be Ugh. freaky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
but Gnaud had even more to tell Ellison about JR's disappearance, including a second party who may have been involved. He told Trooper Ellison, quote, there was a wild looking person with a beard, long hair that had something to do with this boy's disappearance. He seemed to be watching this boy as he moved through the forest. He knows the woods, but he doesn't know the boy. Now remember, when I'm the boy on the hill, that may mean I'm being guided to see what I need to see. The police keep missing something. There's only one vision I see every time. That is the little boy in a hole in the ground. I see it over and over again, trapped. He seems to be in a fetal position. There's still some life energy there. I don't feel dead, end quote. Which, okay, like that gave me chills. I mean, yeah. I can't imagine being Trooper Ellison in this situation. Like, oh my God. Yeah. Uh, being in a hole in the ground, What I mean, what does that mean? Uh, I, does that mean he's in a well? Um, oh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. I mean. I don't know. It's West Virginia. I mean, yeah. we're talking about mountainside homes. Mm -hmm. It's probably well water. Yeah, of course. Uh, in most areas. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem like a, a an area that had, you know, public, <laughs> yeah. like, water and sewer C City plumbing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> So huh. I, I wonder if he had fallen into an open well. Yeah, well, and the, the issue is, too, is that, again, we're talking West Virginia. We're talking coal miners. Right. So there are abandoned mines. There are mm -hmm. all sorts of things right. that a small child who weighed 40 pounds, you know. Could very easily slip into and just disappear. Yeah. Yeah. Despite whatever personal beliefs Ellison may have had about the psychic visions, he knew that he had to follow every single lead, even if it offered only the smallest chance of finding JR. So Ellison went to the woods to the shack that Gano had seen, but there is no trace of the boy. JR's disappearance and the lack of answers ripped his family apart. The shoemakers stopped talking to their family who was there that horrible day. While all of the family members were investigated and cleared of any involvement, Victor Shoemaker agrees with his wife, Nettie, that JR's cousins, Lloyd and Tommy, weren't telling them everything. In 2014, the couple spoke to the Associated Press around the 20th anniversary of JR's disappearance. Of the cousins, Victor said, quote, I think they know what happened, but I don't think the boys heard him, end quote. If Lloyd and Tommy do know more about their cousin's disappearance, they're not talking. The Associated Press tried to reach them for an interview to no avail. The pair has given no information about JR's case to the authorities, the press, or the shoemakers since 1994. Victor believes that someone took his son off that mountain. He said that it's possible that JR is still out there but living under a new identity, saying, quote, that's what we're hoping for is that miracle, end quote. The shoemakers have lived every day waiting for a miracle that has yet to come. They still live in the same apartment in Leesburg, Virginia, the only home JR ever knew. JR's bedroom still has his Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle blanket on the twin bed. His bicycle with training wheels and his beloved Super Nintendo are also still there, along with a shelf full of wrapped Christmas presents that he was never able to open. Reminders of their son are everywhere. The apartment is covered not only in photos taken during his first five years, but also with age-progressed versions of him that offer the family the only glimpse into the future of which they were robbed. Uh, I had no idea. I had no idea you were that close to this. Yeah. So that one has been bouncing around my head <laughs> for the past 25 years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was crazy because um, at the time, you know, I mentioned uh, that it was featured on America's Best Wanted, and it was a very short feature. Like, they didn't devote a whole segment to it. It was just basically at the end, they kind of did a little rundown of people who are missing. But I remember sitting and watching that episode because I watched America's Most Wanted every single week. Uh, of course. It was my favorite show. Uh. Um, and it was. It was so strange. And I don't remember... JR. Like, I don't, because from what I understand, his mom didn't really let him, you know, run around wild like the rest of us were. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and you know, I was 13, he was five. Right. Yeah. Different, um, different set of rules. Yeah. For yeah. Different age groups. Um, but yeah, I mean, but I knew the maintenance man, Victor, like his dad, he, he was always there. And I just, I remember, like I said, the, the yellow ribbons, 
and they just stayed up and the little boy never came back and then I remember months going by and the ribbons getting tattered and dirty right. and eventually yeah. coming down yeah wow Weeks after JR's disappearance, on a bright sunny day, I was playing around the apartment complex with my sister while her mom was at work. Victor came up to us and said something to the effect of, you'd better be careful that you don't get lost. Without thinking, I shot back some stupid remark born from the arrogance of a 13-year-old doing something she had done a million times before. I was uncomfortable and I tried to make a joke of the situation, but it wasn't a joke to Victor. Sometimes, he said to me, his voice steady and his shoulders stooped, Kids get lost. Victor Dwight J.R. Shoemaker Jr. has been missing since May 1st, 1994. He would be 31 years old today. If you have any information at all about JR's whereabouts, please contact West Virginia State Police at 304-822-3561 or the FBI at 202-324-3000. You can see all of the sources for this episode in our show notes and on our website, and then they were gone.com. We'll also have age-progressed photos of JR. And be sure to follow us on social, and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. We'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All writing, research, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza, and additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!